Good day, everyone. We welcome you into the sanctuary of Mount Moriah Baptist Church as we begin our study of God's Word during the month of February. Thank you for studying with us on today. We're going to continue our conversation from the book of Proverbs, specifically Proverbs 21, verses 11 through 22. Proverbs 21, verses 11 through 22. And let me read these verses for your hearing. From the New International Version, it reads this way, When a marker is punished, the simple gain wisdom. By paying attention to the wise, they get knowledge. The righteous one takes note of the house of the wicked and brings the wicked to ruin. Whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. A gift given in secret soothes anger, and a bribe concealed in the cloak pacifies great wrath. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. Whoever strays from the path of prudence comes to rest in the company of the dead. Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. The wicked become a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Whoever pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. One who is wise can go up against the city of the mighty and pull down the stronghold in which they trust. Amen. Proverbs 21, verses 11 through 22. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study today. And we thank you and we praise you for your power and your presence in this place. And we ask and pray that as we study, you will be the ultimate teacher here on today. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen. It is the month of February in which we celebrate as African Americans our culture, our history, our heritage, and the trials and tribulations and how far God has brought us. And so I think that this is also an appropriate time to, to think about the struggles that we have gone through as a people in, in relationship to how God has blessed us over and over again and how God continues, continuously uh, blesses us, even blessing us at this particular moment. And no matter how much wickedness and evil has been done against us, we have prevailed and we have come this far by faith. So as we think about what is going on in the book of Proverbs during this month, uh, let us think about our struggle and let us think about God's blessings upon us. Remember that this section of Proverbs is the second section of Proverbs. They are said to be a collection of sayings from King Solomon. We uh, do not believe that these were the actual words of King Solomon. We just believe that they are attributed to him. And they are sayings of wisdom. Uh, they are sayings of knowledge. Keeping in mind that ultimate wisdom comes from God. God gives us that wisdom through God's word, uh, through worship, through prayer, through God speaking to us. Also, we can get it from mom and daddy, pastor, preacher, aunts and uncles, principals, teachers, professors, even life experiences, co-workers, etc., etc. So there's so many ways in which we can gain wisdom and knowledge. To gain this wisdom and knowledge means that we will be blessed and to be blessed means that we will live. Our lives here will be prosperous and we will have eternal life. Not to gain wisdom is folly. It is foolishness to be 
foolish means ruin, and this ruin means means death. So let's keep all of that in mind as we as we look at this. So let's let's dig in into Proverbs twenty one. Verse 11, when a marker is punished, the simple gain wisdom. By paying attention to the wise, they get knowledge. And this is part of a proverbial pair, two verses together. And so let me read verse 12. The righteous one takes note of the house of the wicked and brings the wicked to ruin. And so we have, again, as we've had so many times in the book of Proverbs, this contrast between the simple and the wise. This contrast between the simple and the wise, especially when it comes to learning. The simple learn by observing the fate of markers. What all of us must do is that we must observe. And we must use uh, this whole uh, notion of discretion that God has given us. And so one of the ways we, we learn is by observing, by looking at what is around us, what is going on, what's in the news, what's on the television, what people are talking about as they go to and fro. And... Those who are simple, those who may not have much wisdom, can learn by looking at those who are foolish, who are markers and their fate and their results. So you can learn when you observe the foolish as to what to do and what not to do. And the simple can also learn by heeding the instruction of the wise. Not only can the simple learn by observing uh, but the simple can also learn by listening or doing or heeding to the instruction of the wise. So just by observation and just by listening, uh, that is a way of instruction. We can learn, we can observe and learn both the fate of the markers, and the instruction of the wise. The righteous refers to God. One of the things that we can do in order to receive wisdom is to listen to God, to observe how God is working in our midst, how God is working in places outside of our immediate territory, how God is working in the lives of others. We can also learn, or the simple can learn, by how God judges the wicked. Because the wicked will be punished. Wickedness will not prevail. God is judge. And we can look at how God judges the wicked, how God judges those who are foolish, the repercussions, the judgment that they receive as they do this wickedness. We can learn from all of this. Again, God is the one who is described as righteous and righteousness will always prevail. And God has a way of exposing those who are wicked, those who are foolish. And even as this proverbial pair suggests that if we are people of wisdom, if we are people who are wise, the way that we live our lives can expose wickedness. It can expose foolishness. And even through the discernment that God has given us, uh, we can overthrow this wickedness or we can cast out or cast down this wickedness. So, again, uh, we can just learn by observing and paying attention to what is around us. Righteous people take note of what is going on around them. And these notes can be used to bring the wicked to ruin. Verse 13, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor 
for our soul cry out and not be answered. One of the things we think about as we celebrate this, this time, uh, remember that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, assassinated while he was uh, going to support the Poor People's Campaign. A and so this is just an example of how God has a preferential treatment for the poor and it is our responsibility to have this same treatment. So there is this contrast between active indifference towards the unfortunate. Active indifference. This whole notion of active indifference means that you might see it, but you do nothing about it. You might hear about it, but you do nothing. And you actively do nothing. You are actively indifferent. You're not swayed one way or another towards those who are unfortunate. So some people just shut their ears to the cries of the poor. They don't want to hear it. They don't care about it. It doesn't move from their ear to their heart. They just shut it out. But look at what is said. As they do, so will it be done to them. They will not hear the cry of the poor, and therefore when they cry out, God will not hear them as well. And remember, this whole reaping and sowing notion is also in the book of Proverbs. The hidden agent in all of this is God. Again, um, God is on the side of the poor, the oppressed. When they cry out, God does not want us to shut our ears to the poor. God wants us to open our ears and our hearts to help them. And therefore, God is not pleased when we do. And therefore... When we close our ears to the poor, to the cries of the poor, so does God close his ears to our cry. The good thing about it is, is that when we do not hear the cries of the poor and the desperate, God always hears. When others do not hear us, God always hears us. And people who are not gracious uh, to the poor and the needy have no part in God's kingdom. So we look out and we care for the less fortunate. Verse 14 says, A gift given in secret soothes anger, and a bribe concealed in the cloak pacifies great wrath. So here we again, again, have this whole notion of the practice of making a concealed bribe, a sort of a modern day um, payout of court settlement. What the proverb says is that it's good uh, to give a gift to sort of settle a dispute. It takes the problem out of public exposure and it prevents embarrassment. So it's, it's okay to do that. And that might be the way to handle the situation. You can do it in secret. It can soothe anger. And on the other hand, if you try to bribe someone, then it can cause a whole lot of whole lot of wrath, a whole lot of anger. So don't try to bribe somebody. Let's go ahead and give them a gift and that can settle whatever's going on. Verse fifteen, when justice is done it brings joy to the righteous but terror to evildoers. We know 
so much about justice and the injustice that we as a people have faced during our time here in this country and people of color, the injustices uh, that we have faced all over the world. But God is a God of justice. God is a God who promotes justice. And we as Christians are to promote justice and practice justice as well. And therefore, this justice is something that we should practice not only among Christians, but among even those who are not Christian. When justice is done, think about this, when justice is done, when people are treated fairly, it brings joy to those who practice justice. But think about when justice prevails, what happens in the eyes of the evildoers, the evildoers become scared, they become afraid. And when they become scared and they become afraid, then they do all that they can to protect what they believe that they have. Think about the Montgomery Improvement Association when uh, Dr. King first went before the mayor and the city council persons and the Montgomery board bus um, companies, representative including a lawyer, and they asked for uh, three simple things that there'll be jobs made for blacks on black bus routes that people would be treated courteous and fair and that um, blacks could still um, fill in from the back and whites uh, from the front but as you got closer to that dividing line first come first serve basis and the meeting went on and Dr. King stated uh, these requests, and he thought that these requests would be granted. Uh, but the lawyer from the Montgomery Bus Company basically said that if we get in, if we give into these concessions, then the blacks of Montgomery will say that they had won over white people, and we cannot have that. So that is an instance in which someone was trying to prevent justice from being done. It just makes sense that people would be treated courteously. It's just common sense that you would want to give people jobs. And it was not breaking the law to have blacks to fill up from the back towards the front and whites from the front uh, to the back and therefore on a first come first serve basis if the bus became packed around the middle that had been done in so many cities in the south but these evildoers those who did not want to promote justice became scared and they did all that they could in order to protect their privilege and we see that going on in this country all the time when justice is done, those who believe that they are on the other side of justice, they become scared and, and therefore they do all that they can in order to protect their privilege. But God says, the proverb says, when justice is done, we should have joy. When justice is done, and we observe it, we should have joy. We should take pleasure when we see justice. We should take pleasure when we see others doing justice, or even when we do justice ourselves. And with respect to justice, think about this. People do, do what corresponds to their character. If they're evil, then they're going to respond to justice and evil. But if they're people who are righteous, then they're going to respond to justice with joy. Verse, verse 16. 
Whoever strays from the path of prudence comes to rest in the company uh, of the dead. And so uh, this says in a few words what we developed at length in chapters 1 through 9. Basically, straying away from wisdom leads to death. Not practicing wisdom leads to death. Again, wisdom leads to blessings, to life, evil, foolishness leads to ruin, leads to death. We, we've seen that said many a time. Verse 17, whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be, will never be rich. This is an ancient saying that says, basically, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Think about wine and oil, olive oil in ancient times. They go with uh, festivity and joy, oil was used for cosmetics to soothe dry skin. And so um, the, these were, were things that, uh, that basically um, brought, brought pleasure. And therefore, it, it is said that when that takes place, then uh, a person can get themselves in, in a world of trouble. Love wine and olive oil, then you spend so much time gathering those things, you spend so much time and trying to keep self looking good. Spend so much money doing that that you will become poor because you're spending all your my money doing that. And loving wine and uh, loving this whole notion of um, treating yourself exorbitantly, uh, you will never become rich. So um, have to put our money in right places. Verse 18, the wicked become a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. The wicked become a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. Again, uh, another verse that signifies that justice will always prevail. And just think about it, no matter what happened in, in the history of our people, whether it was slavery, whether it was Jim Crow, whether it was segregation, or even uh, in this time of uh, integration, just think about it. Uh, those who have tried to oppress us, to enslave us, to keep us down, they have not prevailed. What we have done, we have put our trust in the Lord, we have not been violent. Uh, we have not given the same treatment that others have given unto us. And therefore, what has happened is that God has blessed us. And since we have been upright, what others did not want to give us, the Lord has blessed us with in a way. Verse 19, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. We have seen that in verse 9. Verse 19 is, is a variant. Uh, the desert is a place of disorder. There is uh, not much water, if any, in the desert. Life is basically impossible. So you have this contrast of the dry desert and of cultivated land with life and with water. And this is basically the fundamental thought of Israelite life and experience 
what it is is saying is that y- you want to live in a place in which there is plenty of water, in which there is life and light. And anything that does not promote that, such as a quarrelsome and nagging wife, then really don't need to really don't need to deal with it. And so what it's saying is that it's better to live in the desert where there might be a little bit of peace, a little bit of enjoyment, a little bit of water, than to live in a place uh, where there is none at all. When we looked at this in verse 9, it it meant two things. In verse 9, better to live on a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. It, it basically uh, said two things um, to, to the husband. Don't do anything to tick the wife off because if you do, you'll find yourself in a world of trouble. And uh, number two, um, that it is better uh, to be on that corner of the roof than to have uh, someone who is at you all the time. So, uh, there you be. Verse 20, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. Here we have uh, oil as a symbol of wealth. Think about in ancient Israel, you go to Israel now, there are olive oil. Uh, trees all over the place. And think about God's created order, how the world is ordered according to wisdom and righteousness. God created everything in seven days, and it was good, in six days rather, than it was good, and God rested on the seventh day. And to pursue wisdom and, and righteousness uh, is to set one in the right relationship with God And to set one in the right relationship with God means uh, that one is in the right relationship with material things. So if you practice wisdom and righteousness, again, the results of that is that God will bless you. God will bless you with things you need and some of the things that you want. While the wise, I'm sorry, while... Uh, the foolish differ in their disposal of, of goods. Those who are wise, they gather. They receive because of wisdom and knowledge. And they know how uh, to handle what God has blessed them with. Or they are good stewards of what God has blessed them with. Because they use their wisdom and knowledge. While those who are foolish... They squander. As soon as they get something, uh, they squander. They basically do crazy things and give them away. So the wise store, the wise gather food and olive oil. While as soon as the fool gets them, basically gulps them down, um, Basically, for that particular moment, they have it and then they don't. So the whole notion is in verse uh, 21. If you pursue righteousness and love, then life, prosperity, and honor will be yours. That's why uh, Martin Luther King preached about nonviolence and, and love. Because it was in God's word, but it also was the path he believed and he was right to life, prosperity, and honor, and to equality. All right, let's look at verse uh, 22. As we conclude, verse 22 says, One who is wise can go up against the city of the mighty 
and pull down the stronghold in which they trust. Again, the one who is wise um, basically has God on his or her side. They have godly wisdom. They have godly knowledge. And wisdom and knowledge is more powerful and more valuable than the strength of arms. So wisdom and knowledge is more powerful than military arms. Wisdom and knowledge is more powerful than that fortified city in which the people trust. That saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. So warriors are thought to be mighty, right? They're thought to be powerful. But wisdom is stronger and mightier than the mighty against their city, against the strongholds in which they trust. So what, is, what does Jesus say about this? Let's, let's turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture, Matthew uh, chapter, chapter 6. And uh, verse 33 Well, let me read verse 28 through 34. It reads, these are the words of Christ. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So don't worry about this or that. This seek God's kingdom, seek knowledge, wisdom, and righteousness, and everything you need will be given to you. Amen. That's God's word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study on today, and we thank you for your power and your presence in our midst. Bless us as we ponder upon these words. In the name of the Christ, we pray and give thanks. Amen.